America today is involved in another desperate conflict. Much of the action takes place behind the scenes, set in clinics, homes, and hospitals. Many Americans aren't even aware of this struggle. So brace yourself, because before this film is over, you will visit the bloody fields of battle. You'll meet the people involved in the fighting on both sides, which includes some of the most influential figures in America today. And perhaps for the first time, you'll understand the reasons behind their struggle. Our story concerns abortion and began, strangely enough, in this relatively peaceful suburb of Los Angeles. Malvin Weisberg, a pathologist, owned a large storage container which he kept in his backyard. When he failed to make the final two payments, it was repossessed. Um, we made a decision to repossess it because his uh, check did not clear the bank. And so we sent the truck out to pick up the container. I rolled out there and uh, took the box up and uh, started pulling it up. And uh, it, it was so heavy, it, just, uh, it broke, the, broke the winch and we couldn't get it off the trailer, so we had to leave it on the trailer because it was too heavy. So I was asked by Nick to have a crew go down and unload the container at the other yard. I got a radio call that, uh, from Ron Gillette, the foreman. He said the men were throwing up and there was something really wrong. One of them fell down and hit me right in front of my feet. And it was opened up. And there it was, it was, a, it was a mutilated body. And the more closer I looked at it, it was a human body. And when I came to work the following day, I, uh, I saw it myself, I couldn't believe it. And just, you know, just little bitty babies, you know, just all torn pieces. The heads chopped off, arms, legs, you know, it's just, uh, it just makes you sick to see something like that. Well, really, it's just, you know, it makes you want to cry when you see something like that. Starting at the very front of this container, it was just wall clear to the ceiling and clear to the sides, filled with them. I really don't want to witness it again. Not, not what I saw. Well, as the supervisor for the county of Los Angeles, we found out through the, through the media that 17,000 infants had been uh, stored in a container. So we asked for an investigation by the district attorney and the coroner's office. We found approximately 190 were over 20 weeks of age. I think some as, as long as, uh, as old as 25, 27 weeks. Uh, Mr. Antonovich contacted Mr. Gutierrez. Glenn Wong is a funeral director for a major Los Angeles yes, mortuary. Could, uh, ask us uh, to go ahead and handle the burial of the fetuses. How I came involved was uh, they were asking if it were possible to have anyone photograph these fetuses. And I so happened to be also a photographer. How many fetuses were actually involved in the autopsies? Uh, there were approximately about 40, 44, uh, if I'm correct. And why were the autopsies performed? Uh, they were to find out why uh, or what was the reason of the cause of death. That wasn't apparent? Um, apparently not. No, I've seen some of these fetuses, and believe me, they were apart. But there were some where the uh, eyes were bulging and some where the uh, chest cavity was ripped open. I do remember one was where I saw a hand and a feet all apart. So it was kind of like the hands were intact, the feet were intact, and everything else was more like uh, just a little potpourri, a little of everything, and that's, that was it. That kind of turned me. Here we see the abortionist stretching the cervix very wide open. Dr. John Wilkie, now, who with his wife Barbara, authored The Handbook on Abortion, described the dilation and extraction method used to abort many of the fetuses. Without any anesthetic, the abortionist reaches up into the womb and seizes part of the body of the baby, usually a leg or an arm, twisting and tearing, tears it off and away from the body of the baby. The baby, feeling pain, does not have any anesthetic. Bleeding is extreme. The abortionist returns in there with this grasping pliers-like instrument, tearing more parts of the body away, snapping the spine, and finally the mechanical problem is to get the skull out, and so he usually has to crush the skull in order to bring it out. We had a court order that we would allow us to bury these infants, being a humane act. And the ACLU comes in again saying that uh, this is just uh, tissue 
Uh, we want to incinerate them, and there's no need for a burial. We ought, because if you had a burial, somehow that's going to create a problem. Problem for whom? And at that time, I think everybody there realized this was wrong, that it, that it was really wrong. They could, everybody standing there felt that way. Even the coroner's office, I could sense that they were treating this like it was, was, they were dead people, and they are dead people. That's, that's the way everybody treated it. Evidently, the ACLU doesn't feel that way. And then transferred it all into the, to the original container, and as I understand, it's still up in a county yard someplace. Is it refrigerated? No, it's in a steel container. And how long, do you have any idea how long it'll be there? I don't know, but it's been two years now, so it, who knows. Although the discovery of 17,000 fetuses in a trash container is not an everyday occurrence, it is an event that should surprise no one. For every three days, an equivalent number of fetal children are disposed of in this country. 17,000.